Okay, uh, why zone two? Um, what are we gonna do here? Okay, first we're gonna do a little, we're gonna do a little story time to start off, uh, and then we're gonna do a little physiology. But there's gonna be there isn't going to be a test, and I couldn't explain deep physiology to you either, so don't worry. Uh, we're gonna go fairly really high level on that. Uh, then we'll go high uh, the, the why and how to zone two, and then uh, we'll do like a fun uh, uh, basic run plan with uh, some workout examples. So we will start with. Okay, story time. Okay, so this may sound familiar, but there's this master triathlete. Uh, his name is Jim, and so um, and uh, he gets a bug. He sees a triathlon going on in Homer, Alaska, and he goes, "Ah, I've got to do a triathlon. This is the best thing ever." Um, but he doesn't know how to swim. He doesn't want a bike, and he gave up running ten years ago. But I've got to do a triathlon, right? Cool. So um, I don't have a coach. I just go out. I like buy a bike, put him on a trainer, start just start just doing stuff on the trainer. Um, hire a swim coach, swim with those guys, and then for running, um, I always do the same workout. I, I go outside, I run eight minute miles for eight miles, da, 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 da. Uh, heart rate 160, 155, and just call it done, right? It's a, it's a very task oriented type thing. So, um, so after uh, some initial performance gains, just because I'm just doing some level of training, um, I, I you know, get a little bit of gains, but I also plateau very quickly, and then realize I'm not getting any better with my approach. So, um, and basically why is because I'm training sort of in this, in fact, it's this gray zone, this sort of zone three. I'm not, I'm not running slow enough, and I'm not running fast enough. I'm just sort of running in the middle, right? So, I hire a coach, and you do some metabolic testing, just like uh, Casey and talk about with the Pinoni system. And that then determines my proper uh, training zones, right? Really important. So, my pace, my watts, my heart rate, that kind of thing. Um, and it turns out I have no aerobic or metabolic efficiency whatsoever. So I've been training and move on. So they're like, you're terrible. I'm like, yes, I know. So, um, so they develop this plan and they say, okay, here's the deal. You're going to go run 10 to 11 minute miles all winter long. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but I run 8 minute miles. I, I can't do this. But they say, you got to do this. You got to go run your 10 minute miles, 11 minute miles at a heart rate, 120 to 140. They say, okay, I will do that. So um, I go to the track every week and all my friends are there, and I'm running on the track, 11 minute miles, and they're all stopping and saying, Jim, are you injured? And I'm like, no, I'm not injured, I'm just running zone two. And they're like, well, you look terrible. I'm like, well, it feels terrible. Uh, and my <laughs> and the ego is very hurt, so. Um, so anyway, but I do this for six months, very diligent. Uh, and then there's a big um, triathlon that all the Alaskans go to, in uh, the, the big island uh, in Hawaii, it's a little distant race. It happens in the first uh, weekend in April, and, um, so we go there, about 150 Alaskans, and off the bike, I run a 715 pace, and I've never run a 715 pace. And this is after swimming 1,500 meters and after biking 24 miles in the Hawaiian heat. And I'm like, okay, this is working. I'm now running 45 seconds faster per mile than what I could before. Okay, so there must be something to this this whole uh, zone two thing. Um, and then people would say, well, you were, you were I don't get it, because you were running on the track at 11 minute miles all winter long, and now you're running so fast. I'm like, well, I guess that's how it works. Right? So anyway, so that is, that's really uh, a story about zone two, and we'll get into what zone two really is. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, training zones. You hear um, all kinds of terms about like zone two, you hear polarized, 80, 20, aerobic training. That's sort of all the same thing as, as, as zone two. Um, and there's this great graph right here on, on the right, which sort of, this is, I didn't do this, somebody really smart did this. Um, they took all the different like zones and models and they put it all on one chart. And um, so a lot of sports scientists use the three zone model, uh, which incorporates uh, zone one and two for us. And, uh, and then they have the RPE, one to four is sort of the zone two area. Um, Joe Friel, who some of you may be familiar with, um, this includes the zone zero, and zone one, and zone two. Uh, common terms are easy, endurance, recovery, that kind of thing. Um, it's, a, it's an all-day pace. Zone two is an all-day pace, right? Um, and your heart rate generally is about 70% of your, of your max heart rate. So if you start getting those numbers, you realize it's actually pretty low. Uh, and it should feel easy and feel all day. Um, Jack Daniels refers to an easy zone. And there's some numbers here about lactate. And then the, the last one here is super important. It's the, it's the primary energy sources that we use in zone two. And that's what we're really looking to do is we're looking to burn more fats than we are carbs in, in zone two, right? And, and 
And as endurance athletes, we want to preferentially uh, burn more fats than glycogen, and we'll get to that in the next, in the next slides. Um, so essentially what happens in zone two is that it builds mitochondria, and so over here you'll see, uh, so the zone one, zone two, is you're sort of building mitochondria, and then the rest of the zones, what you're doing is you're improving the function of mitochondria. Okay, so what is mitochondria? Again, this is a little physiology, uh, I can't explain all of it to you, but I want you to think about mitochondria as, as your fuel tank, and as your fuel, and also as sort of a sponge that can take in uh, energy byproducts, right? So basically, you want to build mitochondria. And the best place to build mitochondria really is in this zone one, zone two. Um, and athletes figure this out, whether it's a cyclist, or skiers, or runners, or any endurance athletes, people figured this out a long time ago, that you do basically 80% of your, of your uh, training at easy, and then 20% at a moderate and a hard, and that's sort of what gets you your best results. Um, also, another benefit of zone two is that you become very metabolically efficient, and I'll show you some other slides about that, but again, it's burning more fat than, than burning glycogen. Um, it improves lactate efficiency, um, it improves and builds your slow twisting muscles, which are your endurance muscles. Um, it uh, also generally improves your mechanical strength, again, not getting injured, building up your muscles and your tendons and your joints that easily. Um, and also, zone two allows for just basically more volume, high volume. And uh, any study will show that basically, we all know this intuitively, the more you do something, the better you get at it, whether that is you know, uh, playing piano or running or skiing, whatever, the more you do, the better you get at it. And zone two just allows you to accumulate a lot of time, right? Uh, it's difficult also to overtrain in zone two. You can do it, you can overtrain in zone two, but uh, it's hard. Uh, and, um, and also, sort of separate from that, from performance is that uh, having more mitochondria has been shown to, uh, to reduce your risk of cancer and other sort of metabolic diseases like diabetes, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a health reason as well. So why is glycogen and fat, why is, this, why is this mixture important? Well, um, basically we have about 2,000 calories available to us in glycogen, carbs, and we have about 45,000, 80,000 calories uh, in fat available to us, right? So, and we're doing many things. So what happens if you go on a, um, this is very classic, if you go on say a, a hard run or a hard bike ride, uh, if you with a group of people and they go super hard for say about 90 minutes, uh, and you'll see everybody kind of slow down in about 90 minutes. And what's happening is they just basically burn through all their glycogen, right? And now they're trying to access their fat stores, right? So this is when the bomb starts to begin to happen, right? So you quickly burn through this sort of like, it's just like this little espresso, you just burns right through it, right? Um, I like to think of it as putting a little cup of water in the, in the five gallon bucket, and that little cup of water is your glycogen, and the rest of the water in that five gallon bucket is your fat, right? So you want to get this. Anything, as an endurance athlete, you want to primarily be burning fat as opposed to carbs. So this is another example of sort of like the glycogen stores and sort of fat stores. Um, and then this is um, a, well, I'll show you a couple of different metabolic efficiency profiles, but essentially what happens here is that at, at seven kilometers per hour, this athlete is primarily burning fat here, and this is their carb thing. Carb line, and as it get as the speed increases, um, they're pretty good fat wise. And then as it gets about you know nine and a half kilometers per hour, it starts to turn down here. And almost at about you know ten kilometers per hour, there's this crossover point where they're burning equal carbs and equal fat, right? So it's important to know where this sort of where this crossover is uh, point is. So this is uh, uh, again it's back to the crossover point. So this this here is again fat and carbs. And uh, in, this, in this example, the crossover point here is at seven minutes per mile, right? So um, the whole goal of zone two is really to kind of again, push this crossover point this way, right? Whether that's um, you know, fat carb burning or uh, lactate buildup, um, again, you're always going to push that crossover point over to the right. And there are three profiles here. Uh, the bottom one is a, an athlete who is not very efficient, probably hasn't done much training, and you can see their crossover point is about, you know, about 120 watts, this is on the bike. And then the middle one is where somebody has done some training and their crossover point tends to be about maybe like 180 watts. And then the top one is somebody who's done a lot of zone training, built up a lot of mitochondria, 
uh, is very metabolically efficient, aerobically efficient, and their crossover is about um, past 300 watts, right? So we want to be, obviously, we want to be the people on top, not the people on the bottom. So it's all the same, we want to build this aerobic and metabolic foundation. Um, and really all starts with sort of, it's just, it's, I think if you go as pyramids, um, you have the health at the bottom, obviously that's priority number one, that's sleep, that's uh, exercise, uh, low stress, hydration, that kind of thing. So that's really your foundation. And then your next foundation is this aerobic fitness, sort of the zone two building of mitochondria. And then the next thing on top really is your strength and speed uh, area. Um, and again, you, you want to build this a large aerobic foundation so you can put speed on top of that. That's exactly what happened in the examples. I, I began an athlete that's sort of over here with a very small aerobic foundation. Uh, I didn't have much upside to it, and I built this larger aerobic foundation and was able to, to increase, increase my speed. And you'll start to see adaptations. I uh, usually find about around 100 miles or so, and uh, when people start to build a better, I uh, can run the same speed at maybe the same, uh, at a lower heart rate or uh, faster speed at the same heart rate. And this process can continue for upwards to a decade or longer. So you can continually always be building your aerobic base. It doesn't really stop. Well, if you haven't found where it stops anyway. So, um, so what does zone two really look like, right? Um, I have an example here. Let's see if we can play it. All right. Does this guy look comfortable? He looks super comfortable, right? So this is basically nose breathing, um, sort of an all-day pace, right? This is a great example of somebody who's just running zone two, right? This probably does not look like most people you see running around town who are just running as hard as they can to get their get their lunch run done, right? So this is a pretty, pretty mellow, very easy, again, under 70% of your max heart rate type. So you want to get comfortable enjoying the easy. Okay, so how do we find our zone two? There are many ways to find zone two. Um, the best way, obviously, is using Panoe's, right? It's, the, it's science. You can actually come here and get tested, and then you can say, okay, these are definitively my training zones, right? And you'll always be surprised what your training zones are because nobody really knows. Um, but there are other ways of doing it as well. Again, if you take 70% of your max heart rate, um, in my case, it's about 130 feet per minute, so my zone two runs are about that 130 and, and under area. Again, pretty slow, um, pretty casual, very easy, right? Um, you can also then plug your numbers into like a, you do a threshold uh, type uh, um, test. You can type it into a run calculator on the internet or train peaks. Um, and then simply, you know, if you're looking for zone two, again, can you go out and can you nose breathe and can you just carry on a conversation like this. Like, I could, I could be running down zone two and having this talk. So, we should all be running. By the way, it's super nice out. Thank you for coming. So, I'd be outside doing something else. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Uh, so, but that's really, you know, if you can go out and just have a chat with your mate, um, that's a great way you know you're, you're in zone two, okay? Um, and then, when you're in doubt, like, always aim lower. People always want to aim higher. People always want to work harder. But, uh, sort of building more like fitness is sort of opposite of what sort of got you to um, maybe where you are in your profession, where you grind, 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 hard work, hard work, hard work, and really the zone two and building your aerobic foundation, you actually just want to aim, aim lower and actually make it easier. So it's sort of a little bit counterintuitive than most people think. Uh, it's not the no pain, no gain kind of thing, okay? And then by doing that, also again, you back to you get more volume in that lower zone, right? And uh, and building your mitochondria and uh, avoiding injury. Um, so here's just a, a quick example of like if you wanted to do say a zone two type uh, week running week, right? So uh, most of my athletes have Monday off, they do a day off or lights, uh, lights, uh, light strength, yoga, walking. Tuesday might be a zone two run. Um, this could be five miles, seven miles, eight miles, whatever. And then the last mile they're doing a six by twenty, uh, uh, you know, second fast speed turnover. Some people call them strides. I call them I call them pickups. Um, the forty second recovery. Uh, Wednesday, just a, just an easy again zone two run, and this is this is also during the base period, so it's maybe sort of during the winter time. On Thursday, you might do again back to ten by thirty seconds fast speed. This could be uphill. This could be on the flats. Uh, thirty second recovery. Again, just sort of keeping touch 
with, with speed. We don't want to just run slow all the time. We definitely, even in the base season, we want to introduce some level of uh, a turnover in fast speed and, and speed. Um, and Friday, uh, maybe some people have it off. They might do something else. They may cycle, they may swim, and they do strict work, which is super important. We'll talk about that. And then on the weekend, they'll have a longer zone to run. And the um, great thing about River Valley is we have tons of hills. So we can walk these hills, we can run these hills, but there's just a lot of organic strength that's sort of built into running deer, whether it's on trails or, or along the roads. So just a, a, a basic example of, of a zone two type, type week. Um, and again, you sort of want to periodize your, your year. You want to probably spend you know, the winter time focusing mostly on zone two, and then as you know, maybe 12 weeks out from your hay race, you're starting to build more race pace type efforts and starting to train for the demands of the, of, of the race. So that's maybe that's more tempo, that's more speed work, that's more track work. Uh, whatever it is that you're trying to go after, whether it's half marathon, marathon, or, or a 5K, um, you know. So, okay, common zone two mistakes. Um, and of course, the big one here is that most runners run too fast on their slow days and too slow on their fast days. And when you do that, the coach, coach will be in July to give you this, to give you this sad look. So, don't, don't let go of that. So, check your training weeks and you go, hmm, no. We don't like that at all. So, um, <laughs> another one here is that most people, uh, some people believe they have this. I have to say, I have people, um, especially Dartmouth, you know, coach, coach, coach. You know, I have a unique physiology. I, I can't do zone two. I, my heart rate's too high. It's like no, no, no. You're just aerobically inefficient. Very aerobically inefficient. You've been doing high school sports. You've been go, 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 go for four years, and you've never actually trained aerobically. So, um, getting them around that, saying yes, you are a human. This works for all humans. Uh, you do not have a unique physiology, okay? Um, but they will try all kinds of methods to convince me that they are unique of anybody in the entire world, right? So, um, and I talked about this before, ego, sort of ego gets in the way. Uh, Strava can, uh, can be a real, uh, you can be a real hit on Strava. <laughs> so, you can consider taking a social media hiatus if, uh, if you really want to embrace zone two sometimes and run slow. Um, it's also, you know, people are very, again, people are very task-oriented, not process-oriented. This is a very, very long process, a very process-oriented type, type um, endeavor, okay? Um, sometimes you train with partners who are too fast, and the groups are run too fast, so uh, my advice, if you if you do run with people, like, find people who are slower than you and run, and run with them, and that's just enjoyable. It gets to know those folks as well. Um, and again, the fact is that this is just not a training philosophy. It's really just, it's just physiology. And it 100% works, like all the time. If you're a human, this totally works. So um, that's the that's the that's the good news. And it's also not very. It's, it's there's variety. You know, it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to all be slow slow running, right? You can do lots of different things with, with zone two. You can do farlicks, which is uh, speed play. You can you pick a, you go out for a run, an easy run, but then you say, oh, I'm gonna run fast to that tree. You run fast to that tree, and that's great. I'm gonna run that in that driveway. So we do these pickups and, uh, as well. Um, you can do a cut down run, progression run, things like start off really, really slow and, uh, and get faster every five, 10 seconds, every faster mile. Um, you can do uh, max hill sprints, which is a great way to do a little bit of work, but get a huge gain uh, at, the end of a, at the end of a workout. Um, max sprints, 10 second max sprints are great. Uh, again, we talk about 20 second pickups, 30 second pickups. And then the other thing I'm huge on is, uh, and Neil Price talks about this, is, is you know, run drills and files and strength, right? And so uh, if, you know, if you have 40 minutes uh, for a lunch run, uh, I encourage all my athletes to um, not run the full 40 minutes. I will say, okay, let's do 10 minutes of, of drills and files. Because running is really this really highly coordinated sport, right? Um, everybody can do it, but not everybody's coordinated, right? So the best runners you see are, you, you see them go, wow, they look so beautiful. Why do they look so beautiful? It's like, because they're highly coordinated. So the run drills will help you work on your run form and uh, build and build strength. And they really come in handy, especially late in races, when you're getting really tired and you go, gosh, I just feel tired. I'm kind of bonking or whatever. It's like, it's been a long race. But falling back on those run drills saying, hey, I know how to run well, right? So doing 10 minutes of run drills, for, and then maybe running 20 minutes, and then ending it with, say, for example, um, you know, six by 10 minute max hill sprints at the end, and then a five minute cool down. So that's a great, that's a great 40 minute lunch run. And superior to just like going to run, say for example, your, your four miles. And there's many ways to build your zone two. Um, we live in uh, a recreation mecca here, 
So uh, walking, hiking, trail running, cycling, swimming, lifting weights, stand up paddle, gardening, um, searching for your cats, whatever it is, like just moving your body in a, in a, in a, a nice, easy way, a very conversational way, a healthy breathing way, um, will build will build your aerobic base. Um, Karen and I had a great, we had a great one day. We, we went to the ski way and we ran zone, zone three for three miles and then we hiked the ski way one and a half times and then ran around half a mile. It was, it was beautiful. Zone two. So, okay, recap. So, determine your run zones, either through science, the system, uh, better max heart rate, or simple, simple nose bit. But find out, you know, find some way to find out really what your zones are, and then base your training on that. Uh, and then go out and run, just easy a lot, right? And sometimes a little bit moderate, and sometimes a little bit hard, and that will build your mitochondria, and that will build aerobic and metabolic efficiency. Um, remember to keep it fun. I'm always saying is keep the recreation, recreational athlete, right? None of us here get paid to be professional triathlete or athletes, so keep it recreational. Uh, and what I always end with is, uh, with some of my athletes, uh, the best workouts incorporate joy, health, and community, and that basically means like, is it fun? Is there joy in this workout? Uh, is there health? Is it appropriate workout to do? And are you doing it with somebody else or a group of people? So uh, I'm always bearing that in mind myself and for my athletes is this joy health community because that's really what keeps it keeps it sustainable, keeps it fun, and uh, will keep you active and healthy. Questions? Yes. How would you not, uh, what's what would be a good guideline of the uh, order between zone one and zone two? Um, well, the, uh, I think that's a good question, and I think the if you really want to get that that specific, then I would definitely do some scientific testing, like the, the NOE system. Really <laughs> um, honestly, in my world, we kind of uh, most people are always sort of push the edge or top end of zone two, so most people don't push the zone zone one. Uh, but I like to, I like to think of zone one as sort of this active recovery, right? Maybe it's a maybe it's a fast, some sort of a fast walk, a power walk, kind of thing, right? It's an active, it's like an active. Recovery. And zone two is more looks more like a little bit of a run. Yes. Oh, is it time crunch corner? How do you do zone two training and still get like the physiological benefits? I knew I get this question. It's the best yeah. question. I always get this we always get this question. It's the best one. Um, it's even more important for time crunch athletes to do zone two. You think the opposite way, but it's not the opposite way because again, you want to build this foundation. So if you're a time crunch athlete, say you only have you know, you have 45 minutes at lunch. Uh, if you spend that time just like you know, running zone three and higher, you don't build any aerobic foundation base, and you're not going to get fast results. So even as a time crunch athlete, you still want to employ sort of that 80 20 principle, right? And if you're on a time crunch, there are lots of different ways. Like a 30 minute run in the morning and a 30 minute run in the evening is also super powerful. So there are ways around that. It doesn't always be like an hour or two hours or anything like that. It can be really small chunks and and uh, a double workouts are really powerful as well, too. Even if it's just 30 minutes. The, uh, zone two, the zone two for um, cycling would be different for heart rate uh, between cycling and running. Is that yeah. correct? Generally, about five to ten. Five to ten. So, uh, right. So, generally, if you're, say, your zone two uh, is up to, say, uh, 140. On the run, it generally be around 130 or 135 on the bike. Yeah. In general, mine's about 10, 10 feet difference. Why is that? What's that? Why because it's not, it's just not a weight, it's not a weight bearing activity, right? Much easier on our, on our, on our joints and body. Yeah. What else we got? Yes. Well, what's the ideal duration for? Um, Running zone two, like what is the most uh, ideal, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day to get the most effect? Whatever time you have, I would, I would basically break it up into sort of again, sort of 80 20. Whether that's whether that's 100%, you know, one run, and then maybe it's it could be 70 30 the next the next type of run. But eventually, at the end of the week, you sort of want to end up generally with 80 20, 80 percent of your time as easy running, and 20 percent sort of moderate. And that's where that art science comes into coaching, right? What, what does the athlete need? What are they training? What are they doing? What are they training for, right? So what do you do within that 80% time? 
again, there's a lot of things you can do with that 80% that actually just don't, don't make it boring, just running slow, right? And then there's a lot you can do, a ton you can do in that 20%. It's an absolute ton. Yeah. And that may skew as you get closer to race day, that could be more like 60 40, right? If you're getting ready for a marathon or half marathon, you need to run a lot of tempo, right? This is, that's the reality of it, right? And so um, that may change with the period of time that you're in. Um, the, the figure out the zone thing, you always have to know what your max heart rate is first and then do a percentage to that. Um, years ago, there was a formula that you take 225, subtract your age from it, right. and that gives you a, a rough figure of what your maximum heart rate is. Is that still scientifically valid today, or is that antiquated? It's a, it's a bit antiquated, yeah. There's, it generally it ends up being around that 70% and the lower it's similar. Where, and there's, lots of, there's lots of equations out there, and I was, I was looking at more of these equations actually preparing for this talk, and I found people like, Take your age and minus this and plus that, and it all turns out it's like seventy percent of your of your max heart rate. So, uh, you guys, oh, yeah, yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand this because sure. I have a hard time to like really believe it, but I do believe you. But so like you know, just the one case of so say I run ten hours a week. And I don't, you know, I don't do super fast, but I do fast with Lori here on the track. And then, but I don't do eight hours out of those 10 hours in zone two, because that's too slow, right? <laughs> and so are you saying that if I do eight hours slow, that I will actually do better in overall? How long is it going to take me to do that? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you're, you're, you're right on. And yeah, you should do it those eight hours and generally Again, you're trying to build this mitochondria, right? And this is just physiology again. So, uh, yeah. so you want to build as much mitochondria as you possibly can again, because that's your your fuel, your fuel tank, and sort of the spot, right? And that's the best place to. It does. You do build mitochondria in other zones. So don't walk away from the saying, oh, like it only happens in this one zone. Like there's no magic. Like the body does not. Um, we're not divided, you know, siloed into zones, right? So uh, zones are sort of this. It's a nice way of us. Uh, 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 you know, putting a context around training, but it's certainly not uh, always you know hard and fast. You still get some, you know, mitochondria function in, in biogenesis in higher zones. But what we just figured out is that you get the most mitochondria biogenesis, basically building mitochondria in these in these lower zones, right? So yes, in your case, if you're running ten hours a week, yeah, uh, you probably have a pretty good base. But I would probably you probably end up slowing down. Right? And again, that's where you go get tested and say, okay, what are my true zones? And what can I truly do? Because right now, I'm just, you're just sort of guessing. And so how long would it take if I did this, really? I've seen, I've seen um, I mean, generally people, like within 100 miles, they start to see some improvements. And then they can improve for a decade or more. I mean, I've seen some remarkable things. So the, I guess my big takeaway, when I, start with a, when I start with a new athlete, I always say, you have this narrative in your head of who you are as an athlete. But as we go on this journey, we're going to discover that's not who you are. Okay? So you don't know, you don't know what kind of athlete you are until you really sort of embrace, again, the physiological component of this thing, right? And do best practices. And then you're going to really figure out who you are. And oftentimes it's incredibly surprising how fast people get um, under this, you know, by doing this. So don't let the narrative head say, oh, I'm only this kind of runner, I can only run this fast, um, I, you know, I never, I never get faster, that kind of thing. Um, you can get faster, you will, you absolutely will get faster. It may take 100 miles, it may take you six months. Some people are fast responders, some people are, are slower responders, but you will get faster. And the narrative will change, right? You will be a different time. And that's the super exciting part, I think, about this. Just a follow-up question on that 10-hour example. Is it actually relevant to actually spend the zone time, zone two time running, or is any other sport fun? Because what you indicated earlier, it's probably fine to do it with, with any other sport. And I'm somebody who runs very little, but bikes a lot yellow. Yeah. So I have probably a 10 to 1 ratio between time on the bike, time running. And the 10% that I spend running, I usually spend a good effort. 
where it's easy efforts on the bike or the car. Right, right. Comes through traffic, so you need know this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. 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 In when you're cycling, when you're in your swimming, you are building, you are building this aerobic foundation, right? So you are helping yourself out with that. Um, the, the 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 challenge becomes if you're only running ten percent, is yeah, right? What should you be doing? What's what's appropriate? Exactly. And I mean, there's a certain amount of like just as you know, volume. The more you do, the better you get, right? If you want to play the piano well, then uh, if you play the guitar a lot, you might get a little bit better piano, but you're basically going to just get better playing guitar, right? So. There's a certain amount you have to do just to get better at that individual specific sport, right? And again, that that all depends on you know what's your lifestyle, what's your choices. And again, I get back to like, you know, uh, it's recreation, right? I mean, you, if you figured it out, like if it's fun to do that, then you should continue to do that, right? It's like keep the recreation recreational athlete, right? So I mean, my job as a coach is to point people to the best practices and then say, okay, that's the best practices, but you know, what do you really like to do? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And where does all this sort of fit in? Can we can we match up sort of the best practices more or less with the things that you'd like to do and the goals you're trying to achieve? Right? And sometimes it's not the case. You know, you end up with you know, clients who go, I can't do that, but okay, that's fine. So. Do you have any comments about using heart rate versus lactate levels for, for determining uh, some two? Yeah, uh, I mean certainly if you are interested in lactate and that I mean, it's super helpful to do it. You can lactate test every, you know, three to six months. Um, have, you, have you noticed some big discrepancies among athletes? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, uh, heart rate and lactate. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, lactate and heart rate are really independent. I mean, they can be somewhat linked, but they're also very they're they're independent variables. Yeah. I just have a question about the crop, the carbohydrate and fat crossover. Yeah. How important is that for shorter races versus longer? Does that is that really critical to kind of what do you mean by shorter by shorter races? Like five k, ten k, as opposed to like half marathon or marathon. Probably, probably not in terms of the carb and fat uh, crossover. Probably not as as important for like the shorter for shorter races. Um, you know, in that case, uh, you know, again, if it's a five, you're a five k runner or ten k runner. Really, you're really trying to get what you're trying to do is you're trying to build more mitochondria, right? So you can just become faster. Right? Bigger fuel tank, more fuel, right? But the carb fat thing may not. But the thing about if you're training 80 20, you're getting all the benefits of aerobic efficiency and metabolic efficiency. So you probably, you are you will be a better uh, carb and fat burner regardless of whether you're a 5 or 10 kilo runner, right? But is it your primary concern? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. For Neil, it's, it's a, he's an Ironman guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so he's, he's concerned with it. <laughs> <laughs> This has been great. Uh, thanks. Great questions. Thanks a lot. Hey, Neil, you're going to open your Yeah, yeah. Oh, no? That was a good one. All right. Thank you. Thank you.